was in my early 20s, I had the most brilliant plan of how I was going to end world suffering. And it went like this. I'm going to become a famous actress, have a glamorous life, get super rich, and then I'll have all the money, power, and time to make it happen. I actually tried doing it that way, but I didn't get very far. I didn't realize that 99% of actors were unemployed in the business, which meant I'd have no money to save the world anyway. Now, I believe that everyone in this room has an innate desire to make a difference. That's because most of us enjoy bringing happiness and goodness into people's lives. Whether it's our friends, our spouses, our kids, we don't want others to suffer. And most of us do know in our hearts that things don't have to be just the way they are. Yet oftentimes, something holds us back from taking any kind of action. What holds us back is the belief that we don't have the time, the energy, or the means. And even if we did, where would we begin? And how can just one person help? It was in that spirit I thought, how can I alone end world suffering? Right after asking that question, I saw an ad seeking volunteers for humanitarian mission to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I immediately contacted the coordinator and off to Haiti I went. For the next 10 not so glamorous years, I traveled the world with a humanitarian organization doing my part. We went to Machu Picchu, Argentina, Guatemala, Ecuador, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. Though we worked very long days with little sleep, it didn't matter because every day felt like Christmas. We were giving in a big way and finally making a difference in the world. We gave food, toys, clothing. We built schools and clinics, all of which came from donations. Seeing the joy in the children's eyes when they found that pair of shoes or a piece of clothing that fit them was priceless. It didn't matter that these items weren't brand new. They were just happy to finally have a pair of shoes. For the few days that we were there, all of their problems and worries disappeared. Though they had very little materially by our standards, you could sense an inner joy that arose from them having family and friends and simply being alive. This was universal throughout all of the countries where we volunteered. While giving is an honorable thing to do, turns out it's also healthy. Science tells us the act of giving releases oxytocin, the feel-good hormone. Well, guess what? I was pumped up on oxytocin. I was feeling great about the amazing work I was doing all over the world and excited to see the difference it made in real time. Yet all along, something felt off, and I couldn't quite place my finger on exactly what this thing was until one afternoon at JFK Airport, while waiting to pick up my luggage, I was having a conversation with a spiritual mentor of mine and just questioning him as to why he didn't enjoy the trip. He shared with me that this work did not bring him joy because it was only affirming the people's sense of lack and dependency. He went on to say, we leave them with just a temporary fix and then go back home to our lives. That statement shook me to my core because what he said resonated so deeply and clarified that off feeling that I had been experiencing. As much as I was doing to ease the suffering of others, it wasn't empowering them to elevate beyond their current state. This got me thinking, maybe I need to do more. 
Or maybe I couldn't help them to the fullest of my ability until I had helped myself. The seeds of my motivation for going on these missions were planted when I was eight years old and experiencing my family being deported from the Bahamas back to Haiti. While waiting, we spent some time in a holding camp, very similar to what's going on today. This led to my being separated from them and living in a home where I was physically, mentally, and sexually abused by three generations of men. It was only through a deep knowing that they could touch my body, but they couldn't touch my soul, that I was able to survive. This knowing gave me a spark of hope that I held on to for dear life until I was able to leave that home at age 16. The pain I endured all those years made me very sensitive and compassionate towards the suffering of others. And I knew at an early age that I wanted to make a difference. However, there was no way that I could truly help others while being stuck in the trauma of my past. I embarked on a transformational journey and through intensive inner soul work became my own teacher. As I taught myself to heal, I was freed and was now able to free others. Doing the soul work transformed the way I interacted with everybody, especially those I aided on the missions. I became more present and connected, held a vision of who they could be, and started seeing their situation as changed. I then realized the only way to cause profound and permanent change was for them to shift how they saw themselves and what they believed was possible. Then I could teach them to trust their knowing, like I taught myself to trust mine as a little girl. I had this thing all worked out. For over four years, I traveled to Haiti every six months where we ran a four to five day clinic in the countryside, seeing close to a hundred people a day some of whom traveled at least five hours one way to come and see us. In the beginning, one of our biggest challenges was crowd control. And because they had come from so far away, they were stressed and worried that they wouldn't be seen by the doctors. They didn't have the skills to trust their knowing. We needed to implement a system for things to run, you know, swiftly, quickly, and efficiently. So I decided to ask them to form a line in order to create some organization out of the chaos. The only problem was they weren't used to forming a line. They had always instinctively rushed in, pushing and pulling out of habit, born of fear and desperation. While to us, the act of forming a line may seem basically simple, in developing countries, being aggressive and pushing their way through is a matter of survival. As can happen in large giving operations, much of the food, water, and aid ends up being spilled, wasted, and contaminated because of these chaotic situations where things get out of control. This also creates emotional stress and anxiety, which affects their health equally as much as being dehydrated, hungry, and without medical care. In teaching everyone to form a line, we were ensuring they'd all be treated. Because if at the end of the day they weren't seen, their names would be placed on a list in their order and they'd start back up the next day right where they left off. 
It was critically important that we follow through on our promise as this was teaching them to rise above fear and begin to trust. This trust would become their knowing. It took nearly three years of repetition before we started seeing changes in their behavior. And then one day, something extraordinary happened. They started forming lines on their own. What was even more incredible was when newcomers came to the clinic, they would show them what to do and why it was important to do so. They adopted this new method of forming a line, came to trust the process on their own, and began serving their deepest sense of self in helping each other as well. All along, I was thinking I had to teach them the knowing based on my soul work, but they already had it in them. And this powerful transformation was taking place right before my eyes. Seeing this, I knew in the depths of my soul that what I taught them was far more valuable than any pair of shoes or donation could ever provide. Giving is not the ultimate act of humanitarianism because it doesn't provide the tools to become self-sufficient. When we teach in addition to giving, we leave the person who receives with the capability of being more. Now teaching is an act of abundance because the wisdom and knowledge shared can not only a pers alter a person's life for the better, but even more importantly, the lives of those around them. Oprah once said about the girls of her Leadership Academy in South Africa, not only do they have to change the trajectory of their lives, but they have to change the trajectory of the belief of everybody in their community. This shift in belief or mindset is exactly what's needed to create this kind of abundance. And that's what teaching does. It's the path to a new way of thinking and envisioning new possibilities. It empowers, inspires, elevates, and transforms. When we teach people to discover and connect to their inner power and in knowing, it will have a profound and far-reaching impact. One person teaches another and another, and before you know it, change begins to take place. The sharing of knowledge is endless, while just giving is limited. The miracle of teaching is in its simplicity. It can be done anywhere, anytime, anyplace, and it's free. It comes from a genuine place of caring and being fully present with whomever we're with. There is no deficit, because it is equally beneficial for the giver as well as the receiver. I believe that we all have a divine ability within us to become a teacher and impart our wisdom to others. And the act of teaching is not limited by our level of education, socioeconomic status, or age. There's no question that food, shelter, clothing, and all the basic essentials are necessary for survival. And humanitarianism greatly aids those in need. With a slight shift in perspective, by placing the emphasis on teaching without sacrificing the giving, we can plant the seeds of empowerment and knowledge, lastering, fostering lasting transformation. It is everyone's birthright to experience the fullness of life. And it only takes one thought or idea to put this in motion. This is a knowing we can all begin to trust. Most of us are taught to form a line in kindergarten. Who knew this simple lesson could become the kind of gift that would uplift humanity? Thank you.